totally forgotten after I sent that email to then go and open the quiz. So I opened it up this morning until 11 o'clock tonight. So. Okay, yeah, I was gonna ask about that too. So I was really confused, like I looked all day and I, I'm, I'm, so, frustrated. I'm, I'm so, so sorry. It's been a crazy, it's been crazy. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's open and it'll be up until 11 o'clock tonight. If anybody needs longer than that, just let me know, okay? Uh, I, took, I took a quiz on Monday morning, is that the same Yeah, one? yeah, that's the same one, so you don't need to worry. Um, I just had said that I would open it up longer um, because I was changing things up at the last minute and then I forgot to do it. So, um, for those of you that didn't take that quiz on Monday for this chapter yet, it's open again until 11 o'clock tonight. Okay? All right. So, here's my plan. I'd like to concentrate on that alcohol information um, because there's some some really direct links to problems with college age students so hopefully that would be um, meaningful for you um, and also the tobacco stuff gives me the heat issues <laughs> um, but then if we have time at the end we can we can have um, some discussion or, or questions about the tobacco stuff as well. Um, I do have a PowerPoint up that summarizes the tobacco information on Blackboard. So that that's there if you want it. Um, it's just not doing two classes this week is means it's a bit difficult. There's a lot of information in this chapter. Um, if that is okay with everybody. That's my plan. Yes, ma'am, that's okay. Okay, thank you. All right, so, let's see if this is. Um, so this chapter really is building on the drug abuse chapter 7, um, but just highlighting drugs that we typically consider acceptable, right? Um, caffeine would be another one, okay? How many of us can get going in the morning without a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, right? Because we need that caffeine shot. So alcohol and tobacco are socially acceptable, though tobacco may be a bit less so these days. Um, so it's just um, trying to make us think about our habits around these two particular drugs. And since, as I've already told you guys, I do like my glass of wine or two every night, um, it's lovely to me as well. So let's have a look at some of the terminology because I didn't know um, this before I read this chapter. I'm to interrupt you, but I can't see like the circle on my end. You can't see the slides? No, ma'am, I can't. Uh -oh. Like it's completely blank. Because I usually write down the notes in my journal. Sure. Is anybody else having that problem? <laughs> Will, can you see it? Yeah, I can see all of it. Okay, let me do it again, and maybe if that refreshes the screen, it will show up. Was that Elizabeth that was having trouble? Yes, ma'am, it was me. Okay, 
let's try it again and see if it shows up for you. Otherwise, you may need to, if it doesn't show up, Elizabeth, maybe leave the session and come back in and see if it turns up then. Okay. Okay. So I have shared the PowerPoint. You should be able to see the chapter title. I've seen it now. You got it? Good. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. All right. <clears throat> Okay, lost my train of thought, what was I saying? Oh, yes, so we'll look at some of this terminology because I didn't know this um, before I read this chapter. So I thought it was quite interesting that we have actual kind of terms for different levels of, of alcohol use. So um, they use the term harmful use for People, for example, who um, are drinking heavily on a regular basis, right? So if I understand that drinking heavily, regularly, is going to be damaging my liver, then that's considered harmful use. Um, or if I'm using it... Um, under circumstances where I could get hurt. So um, I would put athletes under that category, right? Athletes who drink, in my view, right? Remember, this is my point of view. Everyone's allowed their own perspective here. But in my point of view, if I'm an athlete and I drink, then I know that that increases my risk of getting hurt in a game or in training, right, because it impacts my coordination and decision making. So I would count that as harmful use. Um, or someone who, um, and this doesn't happen for everybody, but someone who when they drink gets depressed, right? And that doesn't happen for everybody. For many people having a drink or a couple of drinks is, um, it relieves some inhibitions maybe, and, and it makes you feel good and happy, right? But for some people, for a, a smaller population, having a drink makes them depressed. So then if they drink, knowing that that's gonna be the outcome, that would count as harmful use, okay? Then level two is alcohol abuse. So alcohol abuse includes the symptoms that we discussed under harmful use, but adds in a social dimension here. So um, maybe if someone is drinking and then that um, causes problems with their interaction with their family or their work peers, perhaps. Um, or often someone that would fall into category two would be um, someone who uses alcohol in a physically dangerous situation. So drinking and driving, for example, would fall into category two. Um, People in category two, though, don't, aren't at the point or don't have the physiology to develop tolerance to the alcohol. So um, they don't exhibit withdrawal symptoms if they're not drinking. Um, they, they don't develop that tolerance, so they don't need to drink more and more and more in order to get the response that they're looking for from the alcohol. Okay. Um, level three is where we're seeing dependence. All right. So level three would be called alcoholism um, or alcohol dependence. 
I like alcohol dependence better. Somehow it sounds less aggressive. Um, I don't know, maybe that's a weird thing to say. Um, so we have um, here at, it, to, to count as alcohol dependent, you have to meet three symptoms. So either a compulsion to drink or difficulty in controlling the amount you're drinking. Withdrawal symptoms, when you are unable to get a drink. Um, evidence of tolerance. Um, neglect that continues and maybe gets worse of other um, activities and things that are going on in their life, other interests, and continuing to use alcohol when there are clear physical and psychological signs that, that this is not beneficial, okay? Um, so it's quite interesting, if you look in uh, table 8.1, which is on page 242, table 8.1 is looking at drinking levels and so they have level abstainer, light, moderate, heavy or high risk and then characteristics that um, define each of those levels of drinking behaviour. Okay. Um, so that one's really interesting. Table 8.2 um, gives you alcohol dependence syndrome, so it lists those symptoms. And if you meet three of those symptoms, then you would be classified as um, stage three. All right. Um, so one of the things we have to be really careful of uh, is not comparing ourselves to someone else, all right? Um, so BACs are blood alcohol concentration. Um, that's what the, the puffer measures for if you get pulled over by the police, right? And they're clearly linked to your body weight, okay? So that means that us girls have to be much more careful than a great big guy would have to be, right? So um, we have less body mass, right? Um, we have less active stomach enzymes, and so more alcohol reaches the bloodstream for us than it does for our partner, say, right? I have a question about that. Sure. Okay, so how would you determine how much you can drink before you know, like, it will affect you badly? Um, do you mean the blood alcohol concentrations or with relation to the stages? Yeah, yeah. With the blood alcohol uh, concentration? Um, the legal limit is 0.08%, so it's pretty low. Um, I don't have the exact information, but if I pull back from my brain from another health class that I did, I think that if you are a small female, um, I don't consider myself small, but I think clinically I count as small, um, you can't, you, if you drink on an empty stomach, then like one glass of wine on an empty stomach for me would probably put me close to that legal limit, if not over that legal limit, depending upon the strength of the wine. Um, if I'm drinking with food, it's, it's different because it's all about how quickly does the alcohol cross over into your bloodstream. So I don't know, 
about you guys and your parents, but I remember when I was a teenager, um, my parents didn't bother telling us not to drink because that wasn't going to happen. But they would make us drink a glass of milk before we went to a party so that we had that kind of fat protein coating in our stomach to try to slow down the alcohol transition. Um, which now looking back on it was pretty cool of my mom and dad, really. Um, <laughs> They were pretty cool parents. Um, so yeah, I think you have to be, if you're a female, you've got to be pretty careful. Um, I try really hard not to drink and drive at all. If I'm driving, I try not to have a drink. If I'm going to have a drink because I'm out to dinner, then I'll have one glass of wine, but I'm having dinner while I'm drinking that glass of wine. Um, and that actually irritates me because I don't think I should drink at all if I'm driving. But sometimes my discipline is a little weak. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question, Elizabeth. <laughs> Completely. No, that you answered it. Now I understand. I've just never drank before, so I don't oh, right. really know. Okay, well, that's I, I'm impressed that you've never drunk. Well done. I can't say that at your age, when I was your age. I wasn't drinking at your age, I have to say, not in college, because I was competing and I had no money. Um, but when I, when I was 14, 15, 16, I can't say the same thing, however. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, one of the things the book notes, which is a bit icky, um, but it's worth, it, I think it's worth a mention, um, is that the bad side effects of alcohol often curb excessive use of alcohol. So you vomit or you pass out before using ridiculous amounts. Having said that, you have got to be careful, right? I've had several students end up in ER getting their stomachs pumped because they were not paying attention to how much they had drunk at a party, all right? So it's count or have a drink, have a glass of water have a drink, have a glass of water, right? You've got to come up with a strategy that works for you to keep track of how much you're drinking, all right? Because it's really easy to lose track. I do it all the time, trust me, but I'm in my own house, <laughs> relatively safe. Um, so, oops. So this is why I wanted really to concentrate on the on the alcohol part of the of the um, chapter. Although the tobacco stuff is really interesting, and when you guys can come back to campus, you know you've got to remember that this is a tobacco-free campus. There are only limited places on campus where smoking is allowed. And a tobacco-free campus means you cannot chew on campus. So if you come into my class and you're chewing, I will send you out, right? Because that's not allowed. Plus, that's a really bad habit, guys. If any of you are going there, don't go there. It's really, really bad. And um, there's that ghastly picture of that young man with half his face missing because he chewed tobacco in the chapter. Um, yeah, horrible habit. So, this slide really though is, is, I think, very important information for you to take on board. And, you know, if you don't drink, that is, that is, you're, you're on the right road, right? But people, some people like to drink, and drinking in moderation doesn't have to be dangerous, right? Um, but 
So for college age 18 to 24, about 5,000 deaths a year that are related to alcohol. So that doesn't have to be, you know, alcohol poisoning, that could be drinking and driving, or you're not driving but you get in the car with someone who's been drinking and is driving, or your car, you don't drink and then you get hit by someone who's drinking and driving, right? So, um, 1,600 students are killed due to alcohol-related injuries, so um, that can be falling off balconies, or um, fights, or drowning, right? Not here, obviously, because that will take water we don't have, but, you know. So of that 1,600, about 75% are due to car crashes. 25% um, are other, other things, okay? So let me just talk to you about this, this drinking and driving situation. Because I know when I was your age, um, I didn't have a car, I hadn't passed my driving test yet. Um, but I know by the time I was like 22, 23, and I had a car, but my friends lived way, way, way away, so to go to a party, I would have to drive, and there's no way to get home then. Um, so I know when I was younger, right? Um, like I said, we're not judging here. I've done it. I've done the drinking driving thing. I've done the falling asleep at the wheel thing as well. I'm very lucky that it didn't cause an accident, right? Um, but I want, to, I want to describe something to you that we did in undergrad. Um, and it's an amazing experiment, all right? So, what they had us do, um, we had a reaction time test that we could do on a computer, okay? So, they, the instructor, the faculty lecturer had us do our reaction time tests, and then they gave us one shot of vodka. And we got to goof around in the lab for 20 minutes or so um, while this vodka was getting into our system. And then they had us redo the reaction time test, right? Now I can tell you that that shot of vodka, I could still do a handstand, I could still do a cartwheel, I could walk a straight line on the floor, I could balance on one leg, right? So you go into the second reaction time test going, one shot of vodka doesn't make any difference, right? I'm okay. It was significantly slower, the second reaction time test, all right? You've got to think about that in the context of driving a car. How quickly do I have to react if the, if a lorry suddenly drives across the road in front of me, or a child runs out in front of the car, right? Or there's a corner that I wasn't expecting on a dark road that I have to respond to, right? So I just want to give you that piece of information. It was a fascinating experiment, um, and you know, I, I, I almost certainly would not be given permission to run that experiment here, unfortunately. Although I might try that next year um, and see, because we do have reaction time tests here. So, um, you know, it's just, it, you feel like you're okay, right? I can do this. Whatever, close my eyes, right? but your reaction time is significantly slower, one drink. Okay. 
Okay? So, if we look at, oh no, let's do that in a minute. We'll come back there. Okay, so just things to think about. Um, think about this idea of tolerance. Okay. If you're a regular drinker, so it's interesting in my family, um, I'll have a drink every day, but I, I don't remember the last time I got what I would call drunk. I hate that feeling, right? So I don't drink a lot. I would say under these conditions with COVID and being stuck at home and not being able to travel, I think I am exhi I'm exhibiting tolerance because I can see that my two glasses of wine, right, I want to I pour another half a glass. Right? Well, that will turn into three, and that will turn into four, and that could turn into a whole bottle instead of half a bottle, right? So you've got to be careful about this idea. Okay. My sister doesn't drink during the week at all. But at the weekend, oh my god, that girl can party. And she's regularly plastered at the weekends. Right? So different drinking behaviors. Is one safer than the other? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not judging Francesca. That's, she doesn't drink during the week, right? I don't go a day without a drink. So, right? If I'm an athlete, as I've already said, if you take that reaction time test and you translate that into a soccer game, imagine the risk that you're putting yourself at for at minimum spraining an ankle, but what about breaking a leg or, you know, rupturing a um, ligament in my knee or something, all right? What other risks are there, okay? So does it affect your schoolwork? Okay. Don't drink and drive, even though I've told you my experiences. Please don't drink and drive when you come back to town. All right, the interview safe ride is available Thursday afternoon to like midnight or later on a Sunday night. There is no reason at all for you to drive drunk or get into a car with someone who is driving and drinking, all right? Call the number get someone to come and pick you up. It's anonymous, there's no tracking, right? No one is judging, they're just gonna come and get you if you need help, okay? Date rape is often linked to drinking at a party or drinking on the date, all right? Don't, and I know Chief Malden said this the other week, I'm gonna repeat it. All right? Do not accept drinks from other people. Pour your own drink. Don't drink from a punch bowl. All right? Pay attention. You do not know what is in that drink. Okay? Be careful. Some of these day rape drugs that are used, you can't taste them, you can't smell them. There's no way you would know that somebody had slipped something into your drink. All right? One of the oddest motivations that, that we see, at least it's odd to me, is these kind of drinking games that they have in um, fraternities and I don't know about sororities but you know sometimes to get into the fraternity you have to get through this drinking game or something 
right? That's a that's and a weird. Our sorority, oh, I'm sorry. Go on. In, in our sorority on campus, uh, for ZTA, there's a no hazing policy, so none of us drink. Good. Okay. That's. I mean, I think that's a good plan. And campus is an alcohol-free campus as well as a tobacco-free campus. So you actually can't have alcohol on campus um, except for the, the, they've made this new rule about um, football games, right? And um, being allowed to have some alcohol before the game at a barbecue or something like that. Um, but no, I think that's a good idea, and, and on campus, if you're caught with alcohol, I mean, I, I know people that have lost their jobs on campus because they were caught with alcohol, um, or they were caught coming into class to teach class clearly inebriated, right? So there's, there's no tolerance on this campus for that kind of behavior. Um, rightly or wrongly, I have mixed feelings about it, but, you know, I'm not sure that banning something doesn't make it more attractive when you are allowed to do it, you know. Um, I don't know. I don't know. So think about motivations. Why do college students drink? Why do they not drink? So, Elizabeth, your, your example is, is a great example of, you know, why don't I drink, right? Um, and that's interesting because it's not on, um, that's the drinking one, where's the no drinking one? Here we go. Um, yeah, that isn't a, a distinct item on the list that they give, so I think that's an interesting one that you could add in there. All right. um, it's a very stressful time. A lot of people will use alcohol to try to manage their stress levels. And in again, under these circumstances, what we're living through right now, this is hugely stressful. So we're seeing big increases in alcohol use to manage stress, to manage boredom, right? Um, so again, I think it's important to watch out for your friends, right? If you're in a group or you have a flatmate, housemate, and, and you're friends, watch out for each other, right? Watch each other's backs. Um, if you've got a friend who has clearly had too much to drink, right, um, then you've got to make some decisions on their behalf, okay? A, a good rule of thumb, if they can respond to you, so if you call their name and they can look at you or they can say yes, right, then it's probably okay to get them home, get some water into them, and, and get them to bed. If, however, you call their name or you try to talk to them and you're not getting really any, either no response because they've passed out, or they're very um, incoherent, then you need to take them to the ER, right? because they probably need their stomach pumped, which is a very unpleasant experience, apparently. I've never been there, but I know people who have. Right. So I wanted to show you a piece of information, just to, um, because it, it, it's uh, sometimes, easy to go, Dr. Wall's exaggerating again, you know, athletes aren't that big a problem. But let me just show you this. There we go. 
So this is Stanford University in California. Um, and this is their, I've not seen anything equivalent on our athletic page here. Um, I could be wrong, I don't, it's not like I dig around on the athletic page very often, but um, you know, they're, they're trying to provide information to the athletes to discourage them from drinking. There's a lot of research looking at college athletes, particularly soccer, um, with drinking issues. Um, so there's lots of there's lots of research on this as a as a problem, right? Um, some athletes drink because the game is stressful, right? So there, there's so much pressure on them to win a game that they'll resort to using alcohol to try to calm themselves down. Right? Bad plan. Right? Use the yoga, use the meditation that we've done earlier in the semester. Use techniques and strategies that are going to keep you safe on the field. Right? Um, but yeah, I just wanted to point that out. And as I said, there's lots of actual research papers if you go into the library um, web page, you can look for uh, alcohol studies and athletes and pull up quite a lot of information there if, if that was something that interested you.
I, I'm they, not. they do different types of tests. So like they'll they'll do like an NCAA like performance enhancement drug test, and then they'll do like a street drug test. Ah, okay. That's uh, mm -hmm. NCAA is pretty much just PEDs. The street drug is like done by the schools, which doesn't really ever happen because they cost a lot of money. They cost a lot of money, and they're looking for meth and street yeah. Yeah. Uh, street drugs. Okay. Um, we've talked already about most of this information here. Um, so we're we're looking at the movement of the alcohol out of the stomach end and that intestinal tract into the bloodstream. Um, you also want to. Um, I think one of the really useful pieces of information for me at least, um, at my age, is that your liver, it can manage to break down maybe one glass of wine an hour, right? So often what happens is we drink more than our liver can manage to keep on top of. And so we see alcohol build up in the bloodstream. All right. So that's another reason I think that have a drink, have a glass of water, have a drink, have a glass of water it gives your liver a little bit more time to process that alcohol. Okay. Eat food. Okay. Try not to drink on an empty stomach. All right. Um, this one I didn't know, don't take aspirin, and somitidine is a, I um, can't remember what kind of drug that is, hold on, ulcer drug. So if you're taking aspirin, or you've got an ulcer and you're taking something for the ulcer, then you don't want to drink alcohol, even more than normal, I guess, right? So you get a quicker increase in blood alcohol concentration if you're taking aspirin for a headache or an injury or whatever, right? All right. if I'm not paying attention and taking care of my drinking habits, all right? So one of the most obvious that we see is fatty liver, all right? So you'll get, um, you'll get men that have, you know, that beer gut, right? And yet they're not really fat. If you, if you, if someone has a fatty liver and you push their stomach, it's not blood, it's, it's quite hard to touch. That's a, that's a big red flag right there, right? Big red flag. That can, if, if you don't watch out, right, and pay attention to the red flag, then you're at risk for developing cirrhosis, so about 90% of heavy drinkers, so I don't even have to be alcohol dependent, 90% develop a fatty liver. Um, women are going to develop fatty livers at a lower level of alcohol um, intake than men are, right? It's more... Anecdotally, I would say that it's more uh, more obvious in men than women, but I don't have any research to support that out. That's just in my head. Um, or you can, you know, uh, up to 30% of alcoholics are going to develop cirrhosis. Once you've killed that liver off, <laughs> right, if your liver develops cirrhosis, you're on a slippery slope to six foot under. Right? You can't mend it once you've done that much damage to it, okay? 
Um, alcohol hepatitis takes a long time to develop, so you're looking at many, many, many years, you know, I mean a whole lifetime of drinking really for alcohol dependence. There does seem to be some link with cardiovascular disease and certain cancers. Um, again, women may be more at risk, and I've got a link here in case anyone wants to look at that a little bit more. There's a link there for some information there. And then I wanted particularly to talk about fetal alcohol syndrome um, because we're, you know, here you have a little baby who has been permanently damaged by their mother's drinking habit, right? So, um, fetal alcohol syndrome can happen. So we're not talking like if mum has one glass of wine a week when she's pregnant, it would be very, very, very unfortunate for that baby to be born with any of the symptoms of fetal alcohol syndrome, right? We're talking about a mum who drinks regularly. Like if I, if I got pregnant with my drinking habits, that would not be a good plan, right? Not that I can get pregnant, but... Um, so fetal alcohol syndrome, babies are born typically uh, below birth weight. Below birth weight babies are often below birth weight because they don't have good brain development. Um, they have very specific facial um, markers that you can see in these pictures over here. The skin fold underneath the eye tends to be exaggerated. Um, their facial features are quite flat looking, um, a little bit like a Down syndrome child. Um, and they have coordin motor coordination delays and cognitive delays. Right? And don't forget that baby has to go through withdrawal when it's born. Right? Because it's getting alcohol through the placenta. Once the placenta is cut, there's no alcohol anymore. So it then has to go through withdrawal as well as dealing with all these other problems that are permanent, right? This is, again, you can't put this right once the baby is born, okay? So withdrawal, if, if people are exhibiting withdrawal, then they've developed alcohol dependence. Right? Withdrawal can be anything from just kind of being a bit irritable and agitated to something really quite unpleasant. Um, DTs, so you've got like the shakes and you might be seeing things that aren't there. Um, we've talked about the hangover, can you drive the next day? Questionable. How much did you have to drink? Right? You also are more likely to get dehydrated. So the hangover, right, when you get up the next morning and your head feels like it's stuffed with cotton wool, is due to being dehydrated. Right? So it's always a good plan when you've had something to drink to make sure that you drink a large glass of water before you go to bed to try to help with the hangover idea, right? And then be careful with your medications. Some medications um, are going to increase that alcohol response and increase your blood alcohol concentrations faster. Um, you know, be careful, right? Think about your own habits. So, if I look at that table 8.1 that we talked about earlier, if I read those definitions, then 
I would say I'm moderate to heavy, depending on, I don't have more than three drinks a day, do I have more than seven drinks a week, almost certainly, right? So that might make me a heavy drinker. Um, I don't know. I think I could slip in under moderate on table 8.1, right, if I'm being kind to myself. If, though, I go to, where's the other piece of information? Uh, page 245, moderate drinkers who do not abuse alcohol, uh, they drink to feel more comfortable or to relieve stress. They don't drink with any goal in mind such as getting drunk. Heavy drinkers state reasons for their drinking. Their drinking is escapist and goal orientated, so they drink to get drunk. Then I, then I would definitely put myself in moderate here. On that table, if you look at the number of drinks per week, I don't know, I guess I could be heavy, right? It's not about judging. It's about being honest with yourself about your own behaviors, right? So that you know yourself. And then you can make decisions based on understanding your behaviors. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, Elizabeth, thank you for all your questions. Thank you. I don't know, was it Alex who was jumping in with me? <laughs> I'm not sure if it was Alex or Will. I don't know who was jumping in with the extra information for us. Thank you. Um, Friday's activity. I haven't. I, I don't know what to do for Friday's activity, so if anyone has any ideas, let me know. Um, keep an eye out on Blackboard and I'll see what I can come up with. We would, we would be playing pickleball um, and badminton down in the gym if you were here. Um, so I'm not quite sure what to do about it. We may just have to go for another walk this Friday. Um, which would be very nice anyway, because the weather's going to be lovely. So, all right? 